All right, so let's take a look at how to analyze a vector valued function. Uh, specifically, we're going to look at the function r of t. First component is square root of t minus 3. Second component, square root of t minus 2 all over t minus 4. And third component function is tangent of pi times t. So we want to start with step one and find the domain of each component function separately uh, using what you know about uh, functions and the properties. In general, functions have a domain of all real numbers uh, unless you put in a certain input value uh, and it leads to a non-real output value. So you'll look at what input values for t might cause these component functions to be undefined or complex or imaginary. Um, and so, that, of course, you're looking for division by zero, square root of a negative, um, and then the asymptotes for trig functions and logs and things like that. Um, all the usual domain restrictions. And we've got a couple here to look at. So let's start with that first component function. Remember with the square root function, um, uh, you need the uh, radicand to be uh, non-negative. So it can be equal to zero, right? Square root of zero is zero, but square root of a negative is gonna be imaginary. Um, and so what you can do is take that radicand and set it equal to zero, or sorry, set it uh, greater than or equal to zero, um, and then solve that inequality um, if it wasn't obvious how to do it. But then we want the domain in uh, interval notation. And so that would be bracket three comma infinity parentheses. All right, with the second function, uh, we've got uh, another square root, and so that's going to mean t needs to be greater than or equal to zero. Um, but we also have uh, a fraction. And so I just want to combine some things here. If we look at just that part, that tells us that t has to be greater than or equal to zero. Um, if we look at that part, the denominator, it tells us t cannot be equal to four. Um, and so putting those together, you would start with bracket zero, uh, go up to four, parentheses, union, parentheses, and kind of skipping over four there. So that's your domain for that one. All right, and then the last one is tangent, and tangent uh, has asymptotes at uh, plus or minus uh, pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two, and so on. Um, but this is not the basic tangent function, it's tangent pi t. Um, and so what you could do is take that input and, right, that cannot be equal to pi over two times k, where k is some integer. Um, you could simplify by solving for t, dividing both sides by pi, and then you get t is not equal to k over two. So with k being integers, this means that uh, t cannot be equal to plus or minus one half, three halves, five halves, and so on. So a whole bunch of discontinuities there um, for the tangent function. All right, so we did step one, and now we want to find the overall domain of the vector function. Um, this is the intersection in terms of set theory of the domains from step one. Um, and so we just kind of uh, take the union of the discontinuities. Um, and so, we can do this in two steps so that it maybe makes a little more sense. Um, if we take the three to infinity, we got from the first component function, and then we take the zero to four, four to infinity from the second one, um, we, get, we want the union of these, so which numbers are in both sets, 
Um, and you can see that you wouldn't have anything from zero to three. Uh, and so these would combine and give you from three to four and then four to infinity. That's the union of those sets. And now we want to take out these discontinuities, um, which again, if you look at these, a kind of an interval notation, um, we've got negative one half to one half, one half to three halves, three halves to five halves, five halves to seven halves, and so on. Um, now, we're not starting our domain until three, which is six halves. Um, and so you would really uh, go from from three to seven halves, which is 3.5. And then uh, from seven halves to four, right, which is eight halves. And then from four to nine halves, or 4.5. And at that point, it's just gonna follow the tangent path. Nine halves to 11 halves. 11 halves to 13 halves, and so on. So that's the domain for the overall function. It includes um, all the discontinuities from the individual component function. So if, if any one component is not defined, then the overall function isn't. And so that rules out all the numbers except for these. So that is our domain for step two. Um, now, there's some other problems in this section where we end up doing limits for these functions. And it feels like all the interesting limits are going to be endpoints in the domain. Um, if the domain's all real numbers, then the limit at any point is just the value of the function there, right? Um, and so it's only when you have kind of a restricted domain um, that it usually ends up being interesting. I mean, I guess what I just said is, is true if it's continuous. Um, but uh, if the domain's all, even if the domain is all real numbers, if there's any interesting limits, it's going to occur when there's a discontinuity, right? Um, and so those will usually be uh, at these endpoints of the domain. Um, so let's go ahead and find the um, limit uh, at three. Uh, and then we'll do four, and then we'll do the other discontinuity points. So if we take the limit as t goes to three, we can only approach it from the right side um, because the first component function is not defined uh, for real numbers when t is less than three. Um, and if you do that, then actually everything is continuous approaching from the right. Um, and that square root will be uh, getting closer to zero, right? You could just substitute t equals three and for each of these t values. Um, and you get two minus square root of three for the middle one. And then uh, tangent of three pi is gonna be zero. Now, if we take the limit as t goes to four, that was only an issue for the middle component function. So for the first component, you can put in a four, square root of four minus three is square root of one, which is one. Um, for the third component, you can put in uh, a four and you get tangent of four pi is zero. Um, but for that middle one, you can't just use substitution. And so kind of over here, just think of the limit as t goes to four. So you can always break these off and do them as like individual limits like you did in Calc 1. Regular substitution gives you zero over zero. Um, and so what you want to do is factor this. I mean, there's different ways to do it, but if we factor the bottom, it's a difference of squares. 
square root of t minus t u and plus two. And then you have the square root of t minus two uh, on the top and bottom will divide to one. And you get rid of that removal discontinuity. And now you can substitute and get one fourth. So there's the limit there. So you're just taking the limit of each component function. Um, now, if any one of the limits does not exist, the overall limit of the function does not exist, but we still often want to find each of the individual ones. So if one of them doesn't exist, I would still find the others um, because that could still be important. Um, and we'll take a look at doing that here. Take the limit as t goes to um, seven halves. So if you put seven halves in, uh, seven halves minus three is one half. So you get square root of one half. And then if you put in seven halves in the second one, you get two. doesn't really give me anything special. So just putting seven halves in the middle component function, we just get that. It ends up being about a quarter, but that's an irrational number. Um, but so we'll always probably be able to substitute these in these seven halves, nine halves, and all these other discontinuities for the tangent into the first two component functions. But for the tangent, they're going to be undefined um, because the tangent has a, a vertical asymptote there. And the limit from one side will be infinity and one from the other side will be negative infinity. And so that limit will not exist, uh, which means that the overall limit of this function does not exist, right? If any one or more of these components do not, does not exist, then the overall limit does not exist. So those are some examples of finding limits with these functions. Just find the limit for all the component functions. Um, now we look at the end behavior, which is the limit as you go to positive or negative infinity. Now, if you look going to negative infinity, um, this does not exist because the square root function is not defined uh, less than three for real numbers. Um, the for the um, for the square the middle the second component function uh, let's see that also does not exist because that also has a square root of t and so t goes negative that does not exist and uh, the third one also does not exist because the limit as you go to infinity for tangent, uh, it just keeps going up and down um, and never settles on anything. So, so. D and E across the board there. D and E for does not exist, by the way. Um, a little more interesting to look as we go to the positive infinity. Um, the square root function goes to infinity, right? doesn't have a maximum. Um, and the second component function, uh, t will grow faster than square root of t, so that will go to zero. And then the tangent, uh, for the same reason as with negative infinity, it does not exist in positive infinities. But at least we got something other than d and e in those first two components, right? So, you know, there's a little bit of double think here with 
the overall answer is does not exist if any one of the components is does not exist, but also we, we want to know what those individual components are anyway, um, because sometimes that's helpful extra information. Um, kind of like when you learn limits going to infinity means that they don't exist. A limit has to be a real number, but it was still nice to know if it was going to positive or negative infinity, even though it did not exist either way. All right, uh, so the last part here to do is to produce a graph of the function to validate the results. And uh, what we'll do is show how to do that with GeoGebra. Pull up GeoGebra, set it on the 3D calculator. And what I like to do with these is define the component functions up here. That way you can save this and reuse it. And later on, you just need to change these component functions. So there's your x, the first one. And then there's the second one. And there's the third one. Of course, it's a big mess. We don't actually need to see those individual functions. What we want to do is define a space curve um, using curve with a capital V. And you'll see there's a two-dimensional plane curve and then the three-dimensional space curve there. And then for the first three expressions, put in x of t, y of t, z of t. Um, for the parameter, you can see it's kind of telling you what to do here. Parameter put t. The start value, I usually start with negative 10 and then go to 10, and we can change that later on. And it will kind of create this curve for us. So there is our curve. And you see the, the tangent behavior uh, in the Z component. Um, you can see it kind of looking like a rational there going to zero in the other direction. Um, so then what we might want to do is identify some of those points um, that we were interested in. And so when t is equal to 3, um, right, that gave us the point 0, 2 minus square root of 3, and 0. You can see that point there. Maybe we make it a different color. Let's see it a little better. So that's the starting point. And that kind of shows that our limit that we found as t approaches 3 from the left. Um, or from the right, sorry. I guess this is flipped around. There's t approaching from the right, um, and it goes towards that point. Um, the other point we were interested in is where there was a hole, and we found a limit of 1, 1 fourth, and 0. And you can see that that point is also there. So with, as with most of these technology tools, the, the holes won't appear. They're too small to see. Um, but that shows that that limit was also right. Um, and then you could check something like the um, discontinuity at, say, seven halves um, by um, putting in a plane where the x value is um, at seven halves, x was equal to 
square root one half and so that is that first asymptote um, due to the tangent at seven halves, right? B between the three and the four. Um, you could put in similar planes for the, some of the other discontinuities. Um, and then um, you can get uh, a vector to kind of trace this thing out. Um, and the way to do that is to set up T and really just need T to go from 3, 10. So you create a parameter T and then set up a point that is equal to R of T. Remember, R was our curve. And then you can see that that point will kind of trace along. So there's the point. Maybe we make it UBC. So there's the point tracing it. And then we can put a vector going from the origin to this, right? Really, this vector value function is a set of points traced out by a vector, right? And it's the terminal points of all the vectors for the parameter. Um, and so we could say v equals vector, and then put a p in there. And, and then now you, you see the unseen hand that kind of draws the function, right? There is a vector uh, defined by these equations, and the terminal points of that vector um, are what we're looking at. That's the space curve. And then you could kind of move it around in space and study it. That's it. All right. Um, so that feels like we have wrapped it up, and you can move on to analyzing the fill in the blanks in your turn examples. And we'll see you in the next video.